The Unexpurgated Pike Report Forward by Philip Agee Report of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, 1976 Publisher's Note The Pike Committee Report includes extensive footnotes. The footnotes are too substantial to be both included here and maintain the listenable narrative. Thus, the footnotes were excluded from this audiobook version. Interested listeners can find them in the original PDF version of the report, available on archive.org. Section 2. B. Performance. It is one thing to conclude that tens of billions of intelligence dollars have been rather independently spent and sometimes misspent over the past few years. The important issues are whether this spending sufficiently meets our needs, whether Americans have received their money's worth, and whether non-monetary costs sometimes outweigh the benefits. The latter question is a matter of risks and is addressed in a subsequent chapter. To test the first two questions, the committee investigated a representative spectrum of recent events. Some involved war. Some involved law enforcement. Some involved American lives overseas. Some involved personal freedoms at home. All involved important interests. How did intelligence perform? Let the events speak for themselves. 1. Tet. Failure to adapt to a new kind of war. War in Vietnam meant that intelligence had to adapt to an unconventional war, and true perception could spell life or death for Americans. In Tet, perceptions were shattered. Taking advantage of the Vietnamese lunar holiday, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces launched an all-out offensive on January 30, 1968, against virtually every urban center and base in South Vietnam. The scale of attacks was unprecedented in the history of American involvement in the Vietnam War and flatly challenged the reassuring picture intelligence officials in Saigon and Washington had helped present to the American people. With nearly all provincial capitals under siege, the American embassy compound was penetrated by the Viet Cong, and the pacification program set back in all areas. Predictions of successes, announced scant months before, had turned into one of the greatest misjudgments of the war. The committee's investigation of Tet focused on the question of warning in a combat situation and communicating the realities of a guerrilla war to executive branch policymakers. Both are interrelated. Mr. William Colby and the post-mortems certify, quote, warning of the Tet Offensive had not fully anticipated the intensity, coordination, and timing of the enemy attack, end quote. A chief cause was our degraded image of the enemy. A. The Order of Battle Controversy According to Mr. Colby, the CIA had been suspicious of MACV's numerical estimate of the Vietnamese enemy since at least mid-1966. At an order of battle conference held in Saigon in September 1967, the differences between Washington and the field and between CIA and MACV were thrashed out, but according to Mr. Colby, to neither's satisfaction. A resulting compromise represented the best resolution of MACV's preoccupation with viewing the order of battle in the classic military sense and CIA's assessment of enemy capabilities as much broader people's war. The special national intelligence estimate that emerged from this conference quantified the order of battle in MACV terms and merely described other potential enemy forces. Categories now dropped from previous estimates of order of battle totaled as much as 200,000 irregular personnel, self-defense, and secret self-defense forces, and assault, youth, and political cadre. As foot soldiers realized at the time, and as recent studies by the Army Surgeon General confirm, the destructiveness of mines and booby traps which irregular forces set out was increasingly responsible for American losses. This was primarily because American forces were engaging the enemy with increased frequency in his defensive positions. Documents indicate that even during the Order of Battle Conference, there was a large increase in sabotage for which irregulars and civilians were responsible. It appears clear in retrospect that 
Given the nature of protracted guerrilla war, irregular forces were basic determinants of the nature and scope of combat. The numbers game not only diverted a direct confrontation with the realities of war in Vietnam, but also prevented the intelligence community, perhaps the president, and certainly members of Congress, from judging the real changes in Vietnam over time. The Saigon Order of Battle Conference dropped numbers that had been used since 1962 and used those that were left in what appears to have been an arbitrary attempt to maintain some ceiling. It prompted Secretary of State Dean Rusk to cable the American embassy in Saigon on October 21, 1967. Quote, Need your recommendation how to resolve problem of unknown percentage of enemy KIA, killed in action, and WIA, wounded in action, which comes from ranks of self-defense, assault youth, and VC civilian supporters. Since these others not carried as part of VC strength, indicators of attrition could be misleading. End quote. When the Systems Analysis Office in the Department of Defense examined the results of the conference and reinterpreted them in terms consistent with prior quantification, it remarked that the new estimate should have been 395,000 to 480,000 if computed on the same basis as before. Quote, the computations do not show that enemy strength has increased, but that previous estimates of enemy strength were too low. End quote. In the context of the late 1960s, numbers were not at all an academic exercise. Mr. Colby has testified that, quote, the effort to develop a number with respect to the enemy strength was a part of the advising of our government as to the amount of effort we would have to spend to counter that kind of guerrilla effort by the Viet Cong, end quote. They were also used to inform members of Congress and the American public on the progress in Vietnam. The validity of most of the numbers was significantly dubious. Unfortunately, they were relied on for optimistic presentations. For example, while mentioning in parenthetical and classified comments that the numbers supporting its indicators of progress in Vietnam were suspect, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research provided Assistant Secretary of State William Bundy with quantified measures of success. General Westmoreland used such figures to support his contentions in the fall of 1967 that the enemy's, quote, guerrilla force is declining at a steady rate, end quote. In testimony before this committee, Mr. Colby has stated that the infatuation with numbers was, quote, one of the more trying experiences the intelligence community has had to endure, end quote. In the context of the period, it appears that considerable pressure was placed on the intelligence community to generate numbers, less out of tactical necessity than for political purposes. The administration's need was for confirmation of the contention that there was light at the end of the tunnel, that the pacification program was working, and generally that American involvement in Vietnam was not only correct, but effective. In this sense, the intelligence community could not help but find its powers to affect objective analysis substantially undermined. Whether this was by conspiracy or not is somewhat irrelevant. B. The Consequences Four months after the Saigon Order of Battle Conference, the Tet Offensive began. On February 1st, hours after the initial mass assaults, General Westmoreland explained to a press conference, quote, I'm frank to admit I don't know he, the enemy, would do it on the occasion of Ted itself. I thought he would do it before or after, end quote. The U.S. Naval officer in command of the river forces in the Mekong Delta and his army counterpart were similarly caught off guard. Appalled at how poorly positioned they were to provide quick and efficient response, the naval officer, now a retired vice admiral, has told the committee that he, quote, well remembers the words of the Army General who brought us the orders to extricate ourselves from the mudflats as fast as possible. They were, it's Pearl Harbor all over again, end quote. The April 1968 postmortem done by a collection of intelligence officers discussed the general question of warning. 
It concluded that while units in one core area were on alert, Allied forces throughout the country generally were caught unprepared for what was unfolding. Certain forces, even while, quote, on a higher than normal state of alert, end quote, were postured to meet, quote, inevitable ceasefire violations rather than attacks on the cities, end quote. In other areas, quote, the nature and extent of the enemy's attacks were almost totally unexpected, end quote. One half of the South Vietnamese army was on leave at the time of the attacks, observing a 36-hour stand-down. In testimony before this committee, both General Graham and William Colby confirmed the fact of some amount of surprise. General Graham preferred to label it surprise at the enemy's rashness. Mr. Colby spoke of a misjudgment of their potential intensity, coordination, and timing. Even though quick corrective action was taken to salvage American equipment and protect U.S. personnel, the ultimate ramifications on political and military fronts were considerable. General Westmoreland requested a dramatic increase of 206,000 in U.S. troop strength and additional equipment supplies. Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford began rethinking the substance of intelligence. A collection of intelligence officers finally briefed the President of the United States on the realities of the Vietnam War in mid-March, and a few days later, he announced he would not seek re-election. C. The Aftermath The committee received testimony that problems with intelligence in Vietnam were not confined to Tet. Up to the last days of South Vietnam's existence, Certain blinders prevented objective reporting from the field and an accurate assessment of the field situation by Washington. Tet raised the issue of whether American intelligence could effectively account for enemy strength. Later events, among them the collapse of the Saigon government, pointed to a failure to properly acknowledge weaknesses of allies. A real attempt to address the shortcomings of friendly forces in Vietnam was hampered by many factors. During the time of massive American presence, there was a failure to attribute at least partial South Vietnamese success to American air power and logistics support. Consequently, projected ARVN performance in 1975, after the U.S. pullout, was measured against the yardstick of the Easter Offensive of 1972, when American support was crucial. Mission restrictions curtailed necessary collection activity be professional intelligence officers and forced reliance on officials charged with military aid responsibilities. This promoted biased interpretations. The sum total of restrictions, manipulations, and censorship no doubt led to the conclusion Secretary of Defense James R. Schlesinger reached at an April 1975 news conference. He pointed out that, quote, the strength Resiliency and steadfastness of those forces, South Vietnamese, were more highly valued than they should have been, so that the misestimate, I think, applied largely to Saigon's capabilities rather than Hanoi's intentions. End quote. Ultimately, the Vietnam intelligence experience is a sobering reminder of the limitations and pitfalls the United States can expect to encounter if it chooses to align itself in unconventional battle with unconventional allies. It illustrates how very different guerrilla war is from World War II and how much more problematic an alliance with emerging and unstable third world governments will be. Reviewing the American experience in Indochina, an assistant secretary of defense for intelligence wrote a note of caution to the secretary of defense emphasizing the following view. Quote, The problems that occurred in Vietnam or Cambodia can now be occurring in our efforts to assess an allied and an adversary third world country's forces, forces in the Persian Gulf or forces in the Middle East. These problems must be addressed before the U.S. becomes involved in any future crisis in the third world that requires objective and timely intelligence analysis. End quote. Given the substantial American involvement in these areas, strong remedies and honest retrospect appear necessary to overcome and prevent intelligence output that fails, for whatever reason, to present comprehensive and undisguised perceptions of war.
2. Czechoslovakia Failure of Tactical Warning The Czechoslovakia crisis challenged our ability to monitor an attack by the Soviet Union, our prime military adversary. We lost the Russian army for two weeks. Forces of the Warsaw Pact invaded Czechoslovakia on August 20, 1968, to overthrow the Dubček regime, which, since spring, had been moving toward liberal, independent policies the Soviets could not tolerate. U.S. intelligence had understood and reported the basic issues in the developing Soviet-Czech confrontation and concluded that the Soviets were capable of launching an invasion at any time. Intelligence failed, however, to provide a warning that the Soviets had decided to intervene with force. Consequently, President Johnson first learned of the invasion when Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin visited the White House and told him. A review of U.S. intelligence performance during the Czech crisis indicates the agencies were not up to the difficult task of divining Soviet intentions. We knew Soviet capabilities and that the tactical decision to invade might leave only hours of advance warning. The CIA, DIA, and NSA should have been prepared for lightning-quick reaction to Soviet military moves. Czech radio broadcasted news of the invasion at 8.50 p.m. Washington time. CIA translated and transmitted its reports of invasion to Washington at 9.15 p.m. By that time, President Johnson had already met his appointment with the Soviet ambassador. U.S. technical intelligence learned of the Soviet invasion several hours before, but the information did not reach Washington until after the Czech radio message. The CIA later concluded that the information might have made a difference in our ability to provide the tactical warning. One alarming failure of intelligence prior to the invasion occurred during the first two weeks in August, when U.S. intelligence could not locate a Soviet combat formation, which had moved into northern Poland. Director Helms later admitted he was not, quote, happy about those two weeks, end quote, when he could not locate the Soviet troops. Information from technical intelligence, which would have been helpful, was not available until days later. Clandestine reporting in the previous weeks had been so slow to arrive, it proved of little value to current intelligence publications. Director of Central Intelligence Richard Helms reported to the President's foreign intelligence record of failing to detect the actual attack distresses me. The director provided reassurances that the record would have been better, quote, if West Germany had been the target rather than Czechoslovakia, end quote. In 1971, a presidential commission reported to President Nixon that its review of U.S. ability to respond to sudden attack had found serious weaknesses. The Pentagon was directed to improve its warning system. Improvement to the very best possible degree is, of course, the minimum acceptable standard. There will be no more important area for congressional oversight committees to explore thoroughly. 3. The Mideast War The System Breaks Down the Mideast War gave the intelligence community a real test of how it can perform when all its best technology and human skills are focused on a known world hotspot. It failed. On October 6, 1973, Egypt and Syria launched a major assault across the Suez Canal and Golan Heights against a stunned Israel. Although Israel eventually repelled the attack at a cost of thousands of lives, the war's consequences cannot be measured in purely military terms. For Americans, the subsequent U.S.-Soviet confrontation of October 24 and 25, 1975, when the Soviets threatened to unilaterally intervene in the conflict, and the Arab oil embargo are reminders that war in the Middle East has a direct impact on our own national interests. The committee's analysis of the U.S. intelligence performance in this crisis confirms the judgment of an intelligence community post-mortem that, quote, the principal conclusions concerning the imminence of hostilities were quite simply, obviously, and starkly wrong, end quote. Even after the conflict had begun, we did not accurately monitor the course of events. The important question is, 
What went wrong? The last relevant national intelligence estimate before the October War was published five months earlier, in May 1973, during a particularly bad period in Arab-Israeli relations. That estimate addressed the likelihood of war, quote, in the next few weeks, end quote. No long-range view was presented, and the crisis soon passed. The only intelligence report concerned with future political military issues was a May 31, 1973, Bureau of Intelligence and Research, INR, memorandum to Secretary of State Rogers. The authors reasoned correctly that Egypt's President Sadat, for political reasons, would be strongly tempted to resort to arms if diplomacy proved fruitless. Accordingly, the report concluded the, quote, resumption of hostilities by autumn will become a better-than-even bet, end quote, should the diplomatic impasse continue. By September 30, 1975, less than a week before the attack, INR had lost, quote, the wisdom of the spring, end quote. By then, all U.S. intelligence agencies argued that the political climate in the Arab nations was not conducive to a major war. Intelligence consumers were reassured that hostilities were not likely. The next question is why this happened. Analytical bias was part of the problem. In the summer of 1973, the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, CIA, and INR all flatly asserted that Egypt was not capable of a major assault across the Suez Canal. Syria, they said, was not much of a threat either, despite recent acquisitions of sophisticated Soviet SA-6 and SA-7 missile systems and other material. One reason for the analysts' optimism can be found in a 1971 CIA handbook and a passage reiterated and reinforced in discussions in early October 1973. The Arab fighting main, it reported, quote, lacks the necessary physical and cultural qualities for performing effective military services, end quote. The Arabs were thought to be so clearly inferior that another attack would be irrational and thus out of the question. No doubt this attitude was not far in the background when CIA advised Dr. Kissinger on September 30, 1975, that, quote, the whole thrust of President Sadat's activities since last spring has been in direction of bringing moral, political, and economic force to bear on Israel in tacit acknowledgement of Arab unreadiness to make war. End quote. That analysis is quite surprising in light of information acquired during that period, which indicated that imminent war was distinct possibility. By late September, for example, CIA had acquired vital evidence of the timing and warlike intentions of the Arabs. The source was disbelieved for reasons still unclear. There were other positive indications. In late September, the National Security Agency began picking up clear sign that Egypt and Syria were preparing for a major offensive. NSA information indicated that a major foreign nation had become extremely sensitive to the prospect of war and concerned about their citizens and dependents in Egypt. NSA's warnings escaped the serious attention of most intelligence analysts responsible for the Middle East. The fault may well lie in the system itself. NSA intercepts of Egyptian-Syrian war preparations in this period were so voluminous, an average of hundreds of reports each week, that few analysts had time to digest more than a small portion of them. Even fewer analysts were qualified by technical training to read raw NSA traffic. Costly intercepts had scant impact on estimates. These reports lacked visibility and prestige to such a degree that when, two days before the war, an NSA briefer insisted to General Daniel Graham of CIA that unusual Arab movements suggested imminent hostilities, Graham retorted that his staff had reported a ho-hum day in the Middle East. Later, a key military analyst claimed that if he had only seen certain NSA reports, which were so sensitive they had not been disseminated until after the war began, 
he would have forecast hostilities. There was testimony that Dr. Kissinger's secrecy may also have thwarted effective intelligence analysis. Kissinger had been in close contact with both the Soviets and the Arabs throughout the pre-war period. He, presumably, was in a unique position to pick up indications of Arab dissatisfaction with diplomatic talks and signs of an ever-increasing Soviet belief that war would soon break out. When the committee was denied its request for high-level reports, it was unable to learn whether Kissinger elicited this information in any usable form. It is clear, however, that the Secretary passed no such warnings to the intelligence community. The committee was told by high U.S. intelligence officials and policymakers that information from high-level diplomatic contacts is of great intelligence value as an often reliable indicator of both capabilities and intentions. Despite the obvious usefulness of this information, Dr. Kissinger has continued to deny intelligence officials access to notes of his talks with foreign leaders. The morning of the Arab attack, the Watch Committee, which is responsible for crisis alerts, met to assess the likelihood of major hostilities. It concluded that no major coordinated offensive was in the offing. Perhaps one of the reasons for this was that some participants were not cleared for all intelligence data, so the subject and its implications could not be fully discussed. The entire system had malfunctioned. Massive amounts of data had proven indigestible by analysts. Analysts, reluctant to raise false alarms and lulled by anti-Arab biases, ignored clear warnings. Top-level policymakers declined to share perceptions gained from talks with key Arab and Soviet diplomats during the critical period. The fact that Israeli intelligence, to which the U.S. often deferred in this period, had been wrong was small consolation. Performance did not measurably improve after the war's outbreak, when the full resources of the U.S. intelligence community were focused on the Middle East. The Defense Intelligence Agency, having no military contingency plan for the area, proved unable to deal with a deluge of reports from the war zone and quickly found itself in chaos. CIA and INR also engulfed Washington and each other with situation reports, notable for their redundancy. Technical intelligence gathering was untimely, as well as indiscriminate. U.S. national technical means of overhead coverage of the Middle East, according to the postmortem, was of no practical value because of time problems. Two overflight reconnaissance missions on October 13th and 25th, quote, straddled the most critical phase of the war and were, therefore, of little use, end quote. The U.S. failure to accurately track war developments may have contributed to a U.S.-Soviet confrontation and troop alert called by President Nixon on October 24, 1973. A second intelligence community postmortem, the existence of which was not disclosed to the committee until after its hearing, reported that CIA and DIA almost unquestioningly relied on overly optimistic Israeli battle reports. Thus misled, the U.S. clashed with the better-informed Soviets on the latter's strong reaction to Israeli ceasefire violations. Soviet threats to intervene militarily were met with a worldwide U.S. troop alert. Poor intelligence had brought America to the brink of war. Administration witnesses assured the committee that analysts who had performed poorly during the crisis had been replaced. The broader record suggests, however, that the intelligence system faults have survived largely intact. New analysts will continue to find themselves harassed and deluged with largely equivocal, unreadable, or unusable data from CIA, DIA, INR, and the collection-conscious NSA. At the same time, they can expect to be cut off by top-level policymakers from some of the best indicators of hostile intentions. 4. Portugal. The U.S. caught napping. Do our intelligence services know what is going on beneath the surface in allied nations that are not making headlines? Quiet Portugal exploded in 1974, leaving serious questions in its aftermath. 
when a group of left-leaning Portuguese junior military officers ousted the Caetano regime on April 25, 1974, State Department officials represented to the New York Times that Washington knew those who were behind the coup well. State indicated that we were not surprised by the coup and that no significant changes in Portugal's NATO membership were expected. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The committee has reviewed documents which show that the U.S. intelligence community had not even been tasked to probe deeply into Portugal in the waning months of the Caetano dictatorship. As a result, policymakers were given no real warning of the timing and probable ideological consequences of the coup, despite clear and public indications that a political upheaval was at hand. The State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research had not analyzed events in Portugal in the month before the April coup. In retrospect, four warning signals, beginning in late February and continuing through mid-March 1974, should have sparked, quote, speculation at that time that a crisis of major proportions was brewing, end quote, according to the Director of Intelligence and Research, William Hyland. All four events were reported in the American press. One, the publication in February 1974 of General Antonio de Spinola's controversial book criticizing Portugal's African colonial wars, which unleashed an unprecedented public storm. Two, the refusal of General Spinola and the Armed Forces Chief of Staff, Francisco Costa Gomez, to participate in a demonstration of military unity and support for the Catano dictatorship. 3. An abortive coup in mid-March when an infantry regiment attempted to march upon Lisbon. This was followed by the subsequent dismissal of Spinola and Costa Gomez from their commands. 4. A period of rising tensions, the arrests of leftists, and a purge of military officers following the first three developments. The intelligence community, however, was too preoccupied to closely examine the Portuguese situation. Those responsible for writing current intelligence publications had deadlines to meet, meetings to attend, and relatively little time to speculate on developments in the previously sleepy Caetano dictatorship. The committee's investigation indicates there were other, earlier warning signs which might have sparked some intelligence interest. Again, these indications of deeper unrest were not subjected to close analysis. On October 26, 1973, the defense attaché in Lisbon reported to DIA headquarters in the Pentagon rumors of a coup plot and serious discontent among Portuguese military officers. On November 8, 1973, the attaché reported that 860 Portuguese army captains had signed a petition protesting conditions. The attaché quickly concluded these dissidents had no intentions of revolution. Nevertheless, the fact that over 800 military officers felt deeply enough to risk retribution was a good indication of the profound social revolution which Portugal faced. The record does not suggest that the attaché attempted to get to know these junior officers, understand their views, or even record their names. Nor had anyone in Washington assigned him the task of searching for signs of social and political unrest in the Portuguese military. One reason for this was that the director of attaché affairs was not allowed to assign duties to attachés. Assignments were done elsewhere, in an unbelievable demonstration of confusing and inefficient administration. Also in November 1973, the attaché attended a social gathering at the home of a retired American officer, where he heard discussion of right-wing Spanish and Portuguese counter-coup plans should extremists overthrow the Caetano government. Neither the identities of the counter-plotters nor of the extremists were reported by the attaché. No further reference to this report was found in a review of subsequent attaché activities prior to the April coup. In February 1974, the attaché forwarded information from December 1973 on the Portuguese government response to a petition of complaints signed by over 1,500 junior military officers. 
There was no effort to identify the leaders of the petition campaign or to contact any of the signers. After the coup, high CIA officials would complain of the lack of in-depth biographic reporting from the attaché office. A review of all defense attaché reports in the months prior to the coup indicated substantial delays in forwarding reports to Washington. It even took a month for the attaché to send Washington the Spinola book, which unleashed the public storm when it was published in February. Twice, Defense Intelligence Agency headquarters in Washington wrote the attaché office in Lisbon urging the six officers there to be more aggressive, to travel more, and frequent the diplomatic party circuit less. Only the most junior attaché, a Navy lieutenant, made an attempt to probe beyond the obvious. The committee was also told that a serious problem in DIA is a tendency to reward senior officers nearing the ends of their careers by assigning them to attaché posts. Not only were these officers often untrained and unmotivated for intelligence duties, but the director of attaché affairs testified that he was powerless to assign substantive duties to the attachés in any case. The committee did not have the opportunity to review raw CIA reports during the six months prior to the coup. CIA officials who relied on these reports told this committee that the CIA station in Lisbon was so small and so dependent upon the official Portuguese security service for information that very little was picked up. In fact, attachés were in a better position than CIA to get to know the Portuguese military. There is no indication that attachés and the chief of station attempted to pool their resources and combine CIA's knowledge of the Portuguese community movement with attachés' supposed military contacts. The National Intelligence Officer, NIO, for Western Europe did attempt an analysis. A draft memorandum on trends in Portugal, titled Cracks in the Facade, had been in preparation for nearly a month and was almost complete when the April coup erupted and had to be retitled. The document itself, despite its titles, was not attuned to the real causes of intense discontent which produced a leftist military revolt. That same national intelligence officer testified that he had some 25 European countries to monitor with the help of only one staff assistant. NIOs do not have command authority over CIA's intelligence or operations directorates. They cannot order that papers be written, that staffers be detached from the current intelligence office to work on an in-depth estimate. They cannot instruct clandestine operations to collect certain types of information. Nor will the NIO always be informed of covert actions that may be underway in one of his countries. The most disturbing testimony before this committee was official satisfaction with intelligence prior to the Portuguese coup. The director of Attaché Affairs told the committee that intelligence performance had been, quote, generally satisfactory and responsive to requirements, end quote. The National Intelligence Officer for Western Europe said intelligence reports had described, quote, a situation clearly in process of change, an old order coming apart at the seams, end quote. However, both officials quickly admitted under questioning that the attachés had not, in fact, been very aggressive, nor had any intelligence document warned when and how the old order was, quote, coming apart at the seams, end quote. Without access to intelligence reports, this committee might have believed official claims that the system was functioning well. 5. India. Priorities lost. How well does U.S. intelligence keep track of non-military events that affect our foreign policy interests? Not very well, if the first nuclear test in the third world is any indication. The intelligence community estimated, in 1965, that India was capable of conducting a nuclear test and probably would produce a nuclear device within the next few years. In 1972, a special estimate said the, quote, chances are roughly even that India will conduct a nuclear test at some time in the next several years and label it a peaceful explosion, end quote. DIA, in reports distributed only within the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
had stated since 1971 that India might already have a nuclear device. However, when India did explode a nuclear device on May 18, 1974, U.S. intelligence was caught off guard. As the CIA's post-mortem says of the community's surprise, quote, This failure denied the U.S. government the option of considering diplomatic or other initiatives to try to prevent this significant step in nuclear proliferation, end quote. Only one current intelligence article was published in the six months before the May explosion. That article, by DIA, stated for the first time that India might already possess such a device. Perhaps one reason the article did not provoke more debate and initiative was the title, India, a nuclear weapons program will not likely be pursued in the near term. In 1972, U.S. intelligence had picked up 26 reports that India would soon test a device or that she was capable of doing so if the government made the decision to proceed. There were only two reports on the subject from August 1972 to May 1974 when the device was exploded. Neither was pursued with what the CIA claimed was a real follow-up. An April 17, 1974 report indicated that India might have already conducted an unsuccessful nuclear test in the Rajasthan desert. The CIA did not disseminate this report to other agencies, nor did CIA officials pursue the subject. The Director of Central Intelligence had established the bureaucratic device of key intelligence question in 1974. Although nuclear proliferation was on the list, Few officials outside the upper reaches of the bureaucracy expressed much interest. The CIA's General Nuclear Development's priority list did not address India, and the military attachés received no clear instructions on nuclear matters. Nevertheless, previous estimates on India had identified gaps in our information. After India exploded the nuclear device in May 1974, Director Colby wrote Dr. Kissinger to say he intended to amount a more aggressive effort on the nuclear proliferation problem. One of several justifications for national technical means of overhead coverage over India in the two years prior to May 1974 was the nuclear test issue. However, the intelligence community technical analysts were never asked to interpret the data. The CIA's postmortem stated, in effect, The system had been tasked to obtain data, but the analysts had not been asked to examine such data. After the explosion, the analysts were able to identify the test location from pre-test data. Following the failure to anticipate India's test, the United States Intelligence Board agreed to hold one committee meeting a year on nuclear proliferation. Interagency coordinating mechanisms were established. Teams of experts traveled to various countries to impress on American embassy personnel the importance of the proliferation threat. Analysts, once again, were encouraged to talk to each other more. The missing element, as the bureaucracy reshuffled its priorities after the Indian failure, is quite simple. The system itself must be reformed to promote anticipation of, rather than reaction to, important world events. 6. Cyprus. Failure of Intelligence and Policy Cyprus presented a complex mix of politics, personalities, and NATO allies. Unfortunately, a crisis turned to war while intelligence tried to unravel events, and America offended all participants. On the morning of July 15, 1974, Greek strongman General Dimitrios Ioannidis and his military forces on Cyprus overthrew the elected government of Archbishop Makarios. Five days later, Turkey invaded the island, ostensibly to protect the Turkish minority there and to prevent the Greek annexation long promoted by the new Cyprus leadership. Unsatisfied with its initial military success, Turkey renewed its offensive on August 14, 1974. The failure of U.S. intelligence to forecast the coup, despite strong strategic and tactical signs, may be attributed to several factors. Poor reporting from the U.S. Embassy in Athens, in part due to CIA's exclusive access to Ioannidis, 
the general analytical assumption of rational behavior, analysts' reluctance to raise false claims of an impending crisis. The failure to predict the coup is puzzling in view of the abundance of strategic warnings. When Ioannidis wrested power from George Papadopoulos in November 1974, analysts concluded that relations between Greece and Makarios were destined to worsen. Ioannidis' hatred of Makarios, whom he considered pro-communist or worse, has been described as having bordered on pathological. Moreover, Makarios was seen as a stumbling block to Ioannidis' hopes for enosis. Observers agreed that a serious conflict was only a matter of time. By spring of 1974, that confrontation would at times appear imminent with intervening lulls. Each trip to the brink elicited dire warnings to policy officials from Near East desks in the State Department. However, the nuances of these events, indicating a gathering of storm clouds, were largely lost on analysts as their attention remained focused on the Greek-Turkish clash over mineral rights in the Aegean. Cyprus remained a side issue, despite growing evidence that the ioannidis makarios relationship was reaching a critical stage. There would soon be several tactical indications that a coup was in the works. On June 7, 1974, the National Intelligence Daily warned that Ioannidis was actively considering the ouster of Makarios if the archbishop made an, quote, extremely provocative move, end quote. On June 29th, intelligence officials reported that Ioannidis had again told his CIA contact nine days before that if Makarios continued his provocation, the Greek would have only two options, to write off Cyprus with its sizable Greek majority, or eliminate the archbishop as a factor. On July 3, 1974, Makarios made that, quote, extremely provocative move, end quote, by demanding the immediate withdrawal of a Greek National Guard contingent on Cyprus. The ultimatum was delivered in an extraordinary open letter to the Greek government, accusing Ioannidis' associates of attempting his physical as well as political liquidation. On June 29, 1974, Secretary Kissinger, responding to alarms sounded by State Department desk officers, approved a cable to U.S. Ambassador Henry J. Tasca in Athens, instructing that he personally tell Ioannidis of U.S. opposition to any adventure on Cyprus. The instruction was only partially heeded. Tasca, assured by the CIA station chief that Ioannidis would continue to deal only with CIA, and not sharing the State Department desk officer's alarm, was content to pass a message to the Greek leader indirectly. Tasca's colleagues subsequently persuaded Secretary Kissinger's top aide, Joseph Sisko, that a general message passed through regular government channels would have sufficient impact. The ambassador told committee staff that Sisko agreed it was unnecessary for Tasca himself to approach Ioannidis, who had no official government position. That interpretation has been vigorously disputed. It is clear, however, that the embassy took no steps to underscore for Ioannidis the depth of U.S. concern over a possible Cyprus coup attempt. This episode, the exclusive CIA access to Ioannidis, Tasca's indications that he may not have seen all important messages to and from the CIA station, Ioannidis' suggestions of U.S. acquiescence, and Washington's well-known coolness to Makarios have led to public speculation that either U.S. officials were inattentive to the reports of the developing crisis or simply allowed it to happen by not strongly, directly, and unequivocally warning Ioannidis against it. Due to State Department access policies, the committee was unsuccessful in obtaining closely held cables to and from the Secretary of State during this period, including a message the secretary sent to Ioannidis through the CIA the day after the coup. Accordingly, it is impossible to reach a definitive conclusion. On July 3, 1974, a CIA report stated that an individual, later described as, quote, an untested source, end quote, had passed the word that, despite new aggressiveness on Makarios's part, Ioannidis had changed his mind there would be no coup after all. 
For reasons still unclear, this CIA report was embraced and heeded until July 15th, the day of the coup. The intelligence community postmortem appears to have concluded that the tip was probably a ruse. Ioannidis' dubious change of heart went virtually unquestioned despite Makarios's open letter, despite further ultimatums from the archbishop to remove the Greek officers, and despite the en masse resignations of three high-level Greek foreign ministry officials known to be softliners on Cyprus. In this setting, the grotesquely erroneous National Intelligence Bulletin of July 15, 1974, is not surprising, nor are Ambassador Tasca's protestations that he saw no coup on the horizon. Almost at the moment Ioannidis unleashed his forces, a National Intelligence Bulletin was reassuring intelligence consumers with the headline, Ioannidis is taking a moderate line while he plays for time in his dispute with Archbishop Makarios. Results of the events triggered by the coup included thousands of Cypriot casualties and refugees, a narrowly averted war between NATO allies Greece and Turkey, a tragic worsening of U.S. relations with all three nations, and the death of an American ambassador. U.S. intelligence must be accorded a share of the responsibility. The intelligence community somewhat generously termed its performance during the Cyprus crisis as, quote, a mixture of strengths and weaknesses, end quote. The committee's conclusion, after an analysis of the record, is less sanguine. Intelligence clearly failed to provide adequate warning of the coup, and it performed indifferently once the crisis had begun. The analytical failure in the Cyprus crisis brings to mind several parallels with the 1973 Middle East debacle. In both cases, analysts and policymakers were afflicted both with a past history of false alarms and with the rigid notion, unsupported in fact, that foreign leaders invariably act rationally. In the Cyprus crisis, as in the Mideast, analysts were deluged with unreadable and redundant data subsequent to the initial intelligence failure. Still, given the ample indications that Makarios had sufficiently aroused Ioannidis' ire, these analytical quirks should not have prevented a correct interpretation of events. These appear to have been collection failures in this period although additional evidence could probably not have overcome the analytical deficiencies that caused erroneous conclusions. For example, CIA personnel had been instructed by the U.S. ambassador not to establish contacts within the Turkish minority and to obviate any allegations of collusion with the anti makarios EOKAB movement, they were told to seek intelligence on EOKAB by indirect means rather than through direct contact with members of that organization. Finally, signals show intelligence in the area was focused elsewhere, and even after the coup, was not a significant factor. Since the coup inevitably led to the two Turkish invasions and the Greek-Turkish confrontation, the performance of intelligence in predicting military hostilities after the coup is both less important and unremarkable in its successes. Along with most newspaper articles of the time, U.S. intelligence concluded that Ioannidis' installation of Nikos Sampson, notoriously anti-Turk, as Cypriot president, ensured a Turkish invasion of the island. Despite prominent stories in Turkish newspapers and undisguised troop movements at the coast, DIA did not predict the invasion until literally hours before Turkish forces hit the beaches on July 20, 1974. A National Intelligence Officer's report had picked July 20th as a likely invasion date, but was never disseminated to the intelligence community. Perhaps flushed by its success in calling the first Turkish invasion just after Turkish press did, U.S. intelligence appeared to lose interest in the belief that the crisis was over. Thus, there was no real forewarning that the Turkish forces would launch an even more ambitious invasion on August 14th, resulting in the capture of fully one-third of the island. In terms of both its immediate and long-range consequences, the sum total of U.S. intelligence failure during the Cyprus crisis 
may have been the most damaging intelligence performance in recent years. 7. Domestic Internal Security and Counter-Counterintelligence The Intelligence Division of the FBI is divided into two sections, Internal Security and Counterintelligence. The Internal Security Division investigates domestic subversion or extremist groups with the goal of ascertaining whether individuals are violating federal laws or may violate them in the future. These investigations are costly in monetary terms and in terms of personal privacy. Are they effectively and dispassionately controlled in keeping with criminal priorities? Are they efficiently terminated when clearly unproductive? 34 years of investigating the Socialist Workers' Party and over five years spying on the Institute for Policy Studies provide some examples of disturbing answers. A. Institute for Policy Studies The FBI Manual of Instructions allows preliminary investigations to be opened on groups espousing extremist philosophies. If these investigations do not demonstrate reasonable likelihood of uncovering criminal violations, the manual states that they should be terminated within 90 days. In 1968, the FBI saw a sufficient connection between the Institute for Policy Studies, IPS, and the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, to open a preliminary investigation of IPS. The investigation was not terminated after an initial 90-day period, even though it had turned up no evidence that IPS members or their associates were violating federal laws. Six months later, at the end of a vigorous nine-month investigation of IPS, the Washington field office reported the results as negative. The IPS investigation was destined to continue for five more years. The investigation had been based on an SDS connection. During the investigation, however, FBI had received information from a source advising, quote, that, in general, the IPS is not well thought of by the hardcore SDS leaders because members of the IPS are not activists, end quote, except for one IPS leader considered sympathetic with SDS objectives. The FBI was not discouraged by the loss of its investigative base and went ahead reporting unrelated matters. One report, for example, described IPS as, quote, a non-profit, non-taxable institute which studies programs to present policies, end quote. The same report noted the fact that, quote, IPS educational curriculum centers on topics which are critical of the present U.S. system, end quote. In January 1971, the Bureau continued reporting non-criminal matters, such as the fact that the Institute, quote, though small, exerts considerable influence through contacts with educators, Congress, and labor, end quote. It is important to remember that the whole probe began with an investigation of alleged contacts between one IPS staffer and an SDS leader. The FBI had effectively reversed the traditional concept of guilt by association. Instead of a suspect group tainting an individual, the individual had tainted the group. An October 1971 Bureau report said of the Institute, the popular impression of IPS as the think tank of radical United States politics is justified. It has taken and continues to take a major role in the anti-war movement and calls for disarmament. While IPS people see themselves as leaders of radical thought, they would appear to be leaders without a popular constituency. The same report concentrated on IPS suspicions of FBI surveillance. It stated that, quote, they suspect that they are being watched from the building across the street and from adjacent buildings, end quote. The same report went on to say that two members of the Institute had been, quote, observed by a representative of the FBI walking slowly around the block of IPS, sometimes several times, conversing with each other. They appear to be conversing in low tones and in a guarded manner, end quote. In August 1972, an alert bureau agent collected some IPS garbage. The trash revealed no evidence of criminal conduct. However, eight used typewriter ribbons were found. 
even though there were no signs of crimes, and despite the fact that IPS itself was not suspected of crimes, FBI devoted time and money to the expensive process of reconstructing the documents that had been typed by the ribbon. Part of the yield was intimate sexual gossip. FBI officials told committee staff, under oath, that personal information, such as sexual activities, is discarded if it does not bear on a crime. That was not true. Information from the trash retrieval, including the sexual gossip, was incorporated into a number of reports. In each report, the information was attributed to a, quote, source who has supplied reliable information in the past, end quote. In 1973, the Washington Field Office reported that, quote, the organization, IPS, is fragmented into a wide variety of studies and interests, the vast majority of which appear to be within legal limits, end quote. In May 1974, the Washington Field Office concluded that a, quote, paucity of information exists that would support the likelihood of IPS or its leaders to be functioning in violation of federal law, end quote. Only then, after five years and no evidence of lawbreaking, did the investigation become inactive. Socialist Workers' Party the second example involved the Socialist Workers' Party, SWP. The SWP adopted a Declaration of Principles and a Constitution at their founding convention in January 1938. The Declaration of Principles was replete with revolutionary rhetoric of the Marxist left. The fledgling Socialist Workers' Party also swore allegiance to the worldwide organization of Trotsky, the Fourth International. Nevertheless, the SWP dissolved their allegiance with the Fourth International and retracted this Declaration of Principles on December 21, 1940, in order to comply with the Voorhees Act. The FBI maintained that this disassociation with the Fourth International was merely cosmetic. However, the FBI has been unable to prove any illegal relationship between the SWP and the Fourth International. FBI's failure to uncover illegal activity by this political party is not from lack of effort. SWP has been subjected to 34 years of intensive investigation. On November 5, 1975, FBI officials testified that the Fourth International itself was a body made up of Marxist elements around the world and enjoyed no structural power base in the Soviet Union. Significantly, these officials demonstrated no detailed knowledge about the Fourth International. FBI officials did not mention the fact that the Socialist Workers are a legitimate American political party that even runs a candidate for president. Equally as important, the FBI has found no evidence to support a federal prosecution of an SWP member, with the exception of several Smith Act violations in 1941. Since that time, not only have there been no further prosecutions against the SWP for any federal offense, but the portions of the Smith Act under which these earlier convictions had been obtained have been declared unconstitutional. The investigation, which FBI officials tacitly admit has been conducted partially under the aegis of an unprosecutable statute, has revealed that the SWP is a highly law-abiding group. The SWP has even avoided illegal and potentially violent confrontations with the authorities during any sort of civil protests. Nevertheless, this had no impact on 34 years of unproductive spying. According to the presidential candidate of the SWP, Peter Comejo, party members are even forbidden by the SWP to smoke marijuana. The Bureau apparently formulated a philosophy, in this case, to justify their investigation. Considerable resources have been allocated to compound the error of a continuing unproductive investigation and to backstop the preconceptions of FBI personnel. For example, FBI internal security investigators committed a massive manpower allocation of interviewing landlords, employers, fellow employees, and family relations of SWP members. The FBI also maintained intensive surveillance of most, if not all, of the SWP's 2,500 members. Americans are often concerned about privacy invasions of domestic security investigations. 
One-fifth of all investigations initiated by the FBI during the last dealt with security matters. The important issue is whether citizens receive a valuable product in the form of anticipatory intelligence, which would serve as a deterrent to and a prevention of crime. While it is impossible to accurately gauge the deterrent effect of FBI efforts, it is obvious that the FBI failed to anticipate groups dedicated to the overthrow of the existing government and fully committed to violence. The FBI has likewise had a dismal record in the prompt apprehension of fugitives from the new left underground. Domestic intelligence appears to be suffering from a misallocation of resources and efforts. 8. President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board In addition to day-to-day -day bureaucratic efforts to monitor and to improve intelligence, the executive branch oversees performance through mechanisms like the Quasi-Public President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, PFIAB. The issue is whether such a mechanism is viable and effective. Staff investigation suggests that reliance on PFIAB for oversight responsibility is totally without merit. The board, admittedly part-time, meets for one or two-day sessions about six times a year. The chairman spends about half his time on PFIAB affairs. Only two professional staff members support the board, and both are detailees from the very intelligence agencies they are supposed to oversee. The meeting and staff arrangements do not lend themselves to a responsible analysis and review of massive and complex intelligence programs. It is said that, from time to time, PFIAB submits to the President useful documents on covert action and technical collection programs. However, the committee, denied access to these and other periodic PFIAB reports, is unable to determine whether the board has been functioning meaningfully. Two important and limiting factors shed light on the role and performance of the board. The board cannot establish or even oversee policy, but is limited to advising the president with respect to objectives and conduct of the foreign intelligence and related activities. The board's effectiveness also is limited by the interest and confidence of the president, and this has varied considerably throughout the five administrations of the board's existence. The problems do not end there. Board members are chosen for distinguished careers in government, academia, and the business world. Not surprisingly, members of PFIAB, whose principal functions include advice on research and development goals, are typically affiliated with firms holding lucrative intelligence and defense contracts. There are no indications that a PFIAB member has ever improperly profited from his board service. However, after searching board records at the request of committee staff, a PFIAB spokesman stipulated that there are no conflict of interest regulations applicable to its members. Likewise, there were no regulations covering the expensive and confidential contracts they assess and review. Instead, members are provided, on their appointment, with the standards of conduct for the White House staff. There are obviously difficult policy problems in gathering a group of distinguished, knowledgeable citizens and, at the same time, ensuring that the board's activities and judgments are entirely beyond reproach. The part-time nature of PFIAB, if its work is recognized as being cursory, is not necessarily undesirable. Members can bring a fresh perspective from their other pursuits, and they are less compromised by the secrecy and insular views of intelligence agencies. On the other hand, heavy reliance on this board for oversight, without more outside professional staff and greater presidential commitment, is an illusion. 9. National Security Council Intelligence Committee Confusion and indifference are often the rule in executive branch efforts to manage the intelligence community's performance. A good illustration is the National Security Council Intelligence Committee and its Economic Intelligence Subcommittee. Created by President Nixon in a November 5, 1971 memorandum entitled Organization and Management of the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Community, NSCIC was designed as a forum for high-level consumers of intelligence to articulate their needs. 
The Economic Subcommittee was created in late 1974 to provide a similar, lower-level forum for input on economic intelligence. There has been little commitment to these mechanisms on the part of the White House or the consumers for which they were intended. Real doubt exists as to the desirability of their continued existence. The intelligence community has met only twice in four years. It met once in December 1971 to organize and once in August 1974 to reorganize. It has no permanent staff other than the NSC Director for Intelligence Coordination, Richard Ober, a CIA detailee and architect of the controversial CHAOS program. There is no indication that the committee has been effective. A working group is composed of the next lower level of consumers. Although in existence from 1971 to 1974, it apparently did not perform any useful function. This group was revived following the 1974 Intelligence Committee meeting and met seven times thereafter. While working group principles assert a need for intelligence consumers to somehow institutionally convey their problems to collectors, There appears to be a general low level of interest on the part of several members and misgivings as to the effectiveness of the panel as presently constituted. The Economic Intelligence Subcommittee's performance to date can be easily evaluated. While its purpose, to provide consumers of economic intelligence a forum to convey their needs, appears worthwhile on paper, it has produced no results. One meeting was held in May 1975 at the behest of the DCI. The chairman, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, told committee staff that, as a consumer, he was generally satisfied with intelligence input, that the group was a waste of time, and that he intended to hold as few meetings as possible. Displaying an attitude rare among government officials, the chairman disdained formal, high-level committees and called for informal communication at the working level. He has since left his post and may well be replaced by a proponent of bureaucratic committees. Nonetheless, the record strongly calls for an abolition of the subcommittee as presently operated and tasked. 10. The Management and Production of Defense Intelligence The Deputy Secretary of Defense recently expressed frustration at the apparent inability of a multi-billion dollar U.S. intelligence establishment to produce timely and useful information. He reportedly complained that, quote, in a mechanical sense, the system produces the information, but it's so damn big and cumbersome and uncoordinated that you can't get the information properly assessed and to the right people, end quote. Mismanaged and uncoordinated intelligence operations result in more than resource wastage. During the Mideast War and Cyprus Crisis, for example, uncoordinated and duplicative reports compounded the problem of interpreting events. There is a clear need to challenge organizational proliferation, duplication of activity and product, and overlapping of management layers that have plagued defense intelligence for years. The significance of these problems is contained in the fact that the Department of Defense controls nearly 80% of the intelligence community's resources and employs nearly 90% of its personnel. Particular attention must be directed toward the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, an organization established in the early 1960s to integrate and align defense intelligence activities and a major production unit in its own right. As chartered, DIA was to function as both a supervisor and coordinator, and as a centralized producer of intelligence. Over the years, however, it became increasingly apparent that DIA could not accomplish the ambitious management and production goals envisioned at the time of its formation. A string of overviews, including the 1969 Frolk Report, the 1970 Blue Ribbon Defense Panel, the 1971 Schlesinger Study for the Office of Management and Budget, the 1974 Management Review, and the 1975 Panel on Intelligence all found that organizational impediments and product imperfection have continued to persist after years of DIA operation. 
Each, in turn, recommended reorganization and substantive improvements. None solved the problems. DIA lacks comprehensive authority to direct and control resources throughout the Defense Department, as initially envisioned. For example, the vast cryptologic resources in the Armed Services and the National Security Agency are not responsive to DIA. DIA's resource management functions were taken over in 1972 by Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence with a broader mandate to coordinate budgeting. The central problem is bureaucratic politics. The three individual branches of the military resist any organization which might curb their authority to direct programs and allocate resources. They undermine the concept on which DIA was founded by avoiding its authority and preventing it from obtaining qualified manpower. President Nixon recognized that DIA had not achieved its purpose and issued a directive on November 5, 1971, charging the DCI with responsibility for intelligence budget preparation, including the budget for tactical military intelligence. This, too, failed, since the DCI lacked authority for over 80% of the community's budget, which remained in the Department of Defense. The only noticeable effect of these reforms has been an added layer of bureaucracy and a confused sharing of responsibilities. The output side of DIA's operation has been criticized from a number of directions. Over the years, neither the Secretary of Defense nor the Armed Services have been completely satisfied with DIA product. Secretary of Defense McNamara reportedly preferred CIA's product. The services prefer their own analysis. Their criticisms focus on DIA's current intelligence and its estimates. They raise questions as to DIA's capability to produce unique and quality intelligence to meet tactical and national demands. An internal Defense Department memorandum to the Deputy Secretary of Defense in January 1974 indicated the scope of DIA inadequacy in light of the Mideast war failures. The memorandum concluded, quote, What has been stated briefly are only the symptoms of the disease. The cause lies deeper, end quote. While noting the failure of DIA analysts to predict the war, the memo stated, quote, The blame is not theirs alone. It is a corporate failure, a chronic unsoundness of the entire DIA mechanism. Unless we make the required changes in organization, procedures, and personnel, we are going to reap another intelligence failure, and the next one could be a disaster involving U.S. forces. End quote. While several of the root causes of poor performance provide an argument for piecemeal reform, in general, the problems are too permanent to allow for anything less than across-the-board changes. A major obstacle to strong analytic capability within DIA results from the civilian-military nature of DIA in a setting of independent military establishments. As long as the service branches retain viable intelligence units, DIA remains an unattractive assignment and will not attract qualified officers. In addition, Manpower reductions have spread available personnel too thin for effective reporting. Civilians in DIA are confronted with two disincentives. DIA cannot compete with CIA and NSA in appointments and promotions, and persistent military control of higher-grade management positions limits mobility. Officials within DIA are ready to admit they cannot match CIA. They justify their contribution as that of devil's advocates, or honest brokers. Even in military intelligence, the committee was told, quote, they, CIA, are at least our equals, end quote, meaning that DIA was no real improvement over CIA intelligence. In summary, finished intelligence generated by DIA has repeatedly failed to meet consumer needs. The evidence suggests that DIA does not fulfill the ambitious expectations of the early 1960s. It is duplicative, expensive, unattractive, and its production capabilities are handicapped by the consistent weaknesses of its own organization. This is Our Hidden History. <laughs>